Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. We expect this to be life-changing for you as it has been for us. Let's get right to the word. As you can see from the message there today, the message is titled, I got the power. I got the power. I got the power. Come on, bring it up, bring it up. I got the power. Say it. I got the power. Say it. I got the power. Say it. I got the power. Again. I got the power. 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 Now this preaching started. I got the power. I got the power. I got the power. Have you ever seen a movie and, and you see someone that, that when they have this epiphany and they, they realize something, they, they kind of look at everybody and they're like, I got it. Like a genius, a scientist, and all of a sudden he, he figures something out. He goes, I got it. I got it. I figured it out. And they're excited and, 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 and they're walking around and they're running and they're telling everybody, I got it. I figured it out. I got the power. I don't think you got it. No, no, no. I got the power. You got the power. You see, our attitude, our mindset, our walk, our everything will determine if we truly have the power or we're all lip service. I got the power. I got the power. I know you may be saying, Pastor, are you crazy? Why do you keep repeating the same thing? Because I'm making sure that my mouth tells my eyes that I got the power. I got the power. I'm making sure that my ears hear what my mouth has to say. Have you ever told your kids, listen to the words that I am saying? We're pointing at our mouth, and we're saying, listen to the words that I am saying. We're saying, listen to the words that I am saying. God today is telling you, you got the power. You got the power. Now, you may say power. Pastor, power for what? Pastor, to do what? What power do you have? What authority do you have? And do you really have it? And over these next couple of weeks, what God wants us to do is to realize that we have the power. We walk around. I mean, you know, I, I don't say nothing. I, I, I listen a lot of times, and, and my wife will tell you, sometimes she looks at me and she kind of has to say, uh, can you give me your opinion or, or what do you think? And, and it's because, I, I, you know, I grew up in a way where I was always very opinionated. And me being opinionated a lot of times got me into trouble because I always wanted to tell people what I thought was right and the way I wanted things to do. And I realized that doing that made me a micromanager, which didn't allow people to develop into the persons or the call or the gifted human that they were called to be by God. So I got to a point where I realized I have to sometimes just zip it and listen. And, and it was hard for me because I am a very analytical person or was a very analytical person, uh, stubborn as a mule. I mean, geez Louise, when you talk about Naaman and the mule, that's me right there. Um, you know, and, and it takes sometimes power to not show off power. Follow me. It took me a lot of power to tell myself that I needed to be in submission to be able to achieve a higher grade of power. Willpower is the perfect example of power. Willpower is something that we have to not do something rather than something that we have to do something. For example, I have willpower that though you may present to me right now, you know, all the candy in the world, the Swedish fish, the Sour Patch Kids, and all these candies in the world, I won't look at them and eat them all like when I was a kid. I have the willpower to be able to say no to them. 
My willpower stops me, willpower stops me from doing something that I know is not necessarily good for me. That's power. It's power to say no to something. Tell the person next to you, say no to something. Power is not only shown in our ability to lift something, to break something, or to push against something. Power, true power, is shown in our ability not to do certain things. You got to grasp that, absorb it, and make it yours. What power do we have? The Word of God tells us, and we're going to be looking at different points of the Word of God over the next couple of weeks, of how God tells us that we have been called to do certain things. We have been called, I mean, to trample on scorpions. We have been called to, to heal the sick. We have been called to lift the dead from the dead. I mean, did you, can, if I brought a casket here with a dead person, would any of you walk up to the casket and clearly in your mind have no doubt that your prayer can lift that dead person up. If I brought somebody up here with cancer, would you have no doubt and every capability of just coming and taking your hand and putting it over that person and in the name of Jesus Christ, knowing that when you release that word, that prayer, that person was going to be healed? Do you have that capability? Is it in your mind? Do you have the capability of knowing that, that you can actually come up to someone that is broke, I mean broken, whether it be physically, whether it be financially, whatever the case is, and know that you can pray over that person and that person immediately will be restored, do you have that power? I know. And this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to have you repeat over and over, I got the power. Because it's not into your mouth start speaking out the fact that you do have the power, that your eyes, your ears, your brain, and everything else about you is going to sense, is going to come into one accord and say, I truly do have the power. You know, the Word of God says where there's two or three in His name, He is present. Amen? We all know that. And that is 100% accurate. It's 150,000% accurate. And I would go as far as, as reinstating the fact that even when there's two senses in us that come into agreement about something, God is present. And when he's present in us, it establishes a new norm. That new norm that it establishes is power. For example, if I don't see God, which none of us can physically see him, but I hear God and I perceive him in my mind, in my spirit, and I speak about him, eventually what's going to happen is that I'm going to start to see him. Now you may say, but pastor, what do you mean you're going to start to see him? You're going to start allocating the evidence that he leaves that he exists to him rather than to this world. For example, when you wake up in the morning, you're not going to look up and say, oh, it's sunny today. You're going to say, thank you, Lord, because you provided a sun for us. Thank you, Lord, because you made the sun and the moon and the stars and the heavens. You know, when you look at someone that's beautiful, you're not going to say, wow, that person must have been a very nice-looking chimpanzee when they were first born. They must have come from a nice line of apes. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of in my life. You're going to be able to say, wow, God, you created this person. You formed this person. There's a uniqueness to this person. You know, and, and, and who I may look at and say, wow, that person is really pretty. You may look at it and say, wow, that, that's just a normal person. Do you understand? God has done something different in each one of us. Our senses are all different. Our senses are constructed or destroyed based upon our experiences. And I'm talking heavily on senses because it's not until we get our senses right that our power is going to be able to be complete. Amen? So I got to get us today to the point where we can see something like this word. And let's say you're confronting something like fear. Your sense, you look at fear. If you've had some kind of trauma with fear, this word looks huge in front of your eyes. It looks enormous. You know, in baseball, there's this saying that when you're in a hot streak, when you're at a batter and you're hitting the ball, it gets to the point where you're so hot that the ball looks like a volleyball coming down towards you. So they say, you know, and he can hit any ball. You can throw it in the air up here. You can throw it down here. It doesn't matter. It all looks like a big volleyball to him. So he's going to smack it all over the park. 
100% right. He's on a hot streak. But there's times where you get into a cold streak, and all of a sudden now that, that ball, that word, becomes so small, and he misses it left and right, and he just can't get his bat around, and he's late on every pitch. And, and tell me if this is making sense here for a moment, because I, I want us to understand that, that our senses are going to determine whether this word fear is enormous or it's tiny. If you're not dealing with fear, fear is not something that you're worried about. It's fear. What we do, you know, it exists. It exists, obviously, but it's not this huge problem. Your senses don't tell you, "Oh my gosh, fear," and then immediately you think about at night when you have to go to the bathroom and you don't get up because you say, "I'm too afraid of the dark," or or what if there's something in my apartment, or you hear a noise, and because you're single, or because you know your father wasn't there when you were a child, all of a sudden that noise immediately sparks up something in you, and you say. Oh my gosh, who is it? Who could it be? You know, and you're paranoid, and, and, and it was a cat or a dog or a raccoon in your garbage can. You know, but, but since fear is so predominant in your senses, everything is amplified. And everything that you deal with and confront is enormous. What God wants us to do is he wants us to begin to get our senses right and to get our senses to the place where we can convert that fear into something small. But the only way we can have this transformation take place is if we realize that fear is fear. It's small. Fear has no power over you. I may say it until I'm blue in the face, but if you struggle with fear, you're not going to believe it until you have that personal experience. So how do we get to here to here? How do we convert from fear big to fear small? It all has to do with our senses. Now, how do we manipulate our senses? Let's talk, you know, manipulation is usually a bad word. Let's talk about it in a good sense. How do I manipulate my senses? I manipulate my senses by gearing myself up and surrounding myself by the people who have experience with whatever it is that I'm dealing with. If I am someone who wants to get buff, I want to hang out with someone that's already buff. You know, one of the worst mistakes that I see or I hear about in counseling is when couples that are having problems go to other couples that are worse off or single people. And I say, why exactly would you be going to that person? Well, you know, they were there for me. Yeah, they're there for you. Obviously, misery loves company. And when misery hears that you're doing bad, they're going to run to you because that's what misery does. But how about... If when we want to stimulate a change in our life and in our senses, we run towards someone that we see as an expert in that area, what can happen? A transformation. All of a sudden, if I want to be buff, I'm going to, you know, there's this one guy in my office that, that he was from Captain Pat. And, you know, he used to be a bodybuilder years back. When I met him, he wasn't a bodybuilder anymore. He was a normal size guy, sweetest guy in the world, nice as can be. And probably about a year ago, he said, you know what, I'm going to start bodybuilding again. You know, and I looked at him, and in my mind, honestly, I said, okay, you know, he could probably, maybe he'll get cut, you know, cut up, and okay. The guy's a beast. He looks like Hulk, you know, but it, it took a lot in him. I mean, I see him with these little Tupperwares that are this big, and that's his meal, and he has like 10 of them a day, and, and he literally is like two scoops, and that's his food. And the guy goes to the gym for hours upon hours. Now, there's a lot of people in my, in my job that are also overweight. So if I want to start getting buff, who am I going to go talk to? Captain Pat. Why? I see it. I see the result. You know, I, I, I'm talking about it in the finances because I think most of us can correlate to this. You see things like multi-level marketers and multi-level marketers, you know, the people on top are always making the gazillion dollars and, and they're doing good. And then all the people on the bottom that are trying to live the dream and they tell you fake it till you make it and you're running around saying, ooh, I, I show you how to make a million dollars. Really? Show me your million. I haven't made them yet. Come back to me when you made your million. Why? Because unless you're already there, there's no way that you're going to be able to tell me how to get there. In Christianity... We have to surround ourselves with the same spirit as to what we're trying to get to. If I want to learn how to worship, i got to get into the mind of a Brother Miguel. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys noticed, but Brother Miguel, he's on fire. Amen. 
Amen. That guy, you could be playing a slow song and he's dancing. But that's the way it should be. You know, to be able to see him, that stimulates me to say, all right, maybe I can do it even though my foot hurts. Maybe I can do it even though this hurts. Maybe I can do it. And, and that's the idea of church. You see, anyone looking for a perfect church or perfect people should not go to a church. Don't go. Because you're not going to find it. I don't care how big your church is. I don't care how small it is. You're not going to find a perfect church. You're not going to find a perfect pastor. You're not going to find perfect leaders. You're not going to find perfect anything in church. The only thing that's perfect in church is God, and that's it. That's it. But I may have a, a shoulder that's not 100%. But you know what? My elbows are pretty good. I may have one flat foot. But you know what? My other foot is pretty good. And why am I emphasizing this? I'm emphasizing this that though I may have an imperfect foot on one side, I have a, fine, a perfectly fine foot on the other. I'm going to learn from this foot. Though you may have imperfections in certain areas that I may look at and say, hmm, there's other areas in you that I can look at and say, you know what? That's perfectly fine. And I'm going to learn from your perfectly fine. You notice how when you have a pain in one foot, your other foot compensates for it? You know, if, if it hurts when you put your foot down, all of a sudden now your other foot is kind of carrying more of the weight. That ever happened to you? That's the same thing that's supposed to happen in church. When I have an imperfect situation here, the perfect part of you is supposed to come in and help my imperfect situation. How? Testifying. Just telling me that there's a way. You know, I, I love when people are up here at the altar and they're crying and they're repenting and all that. And then you get those people that are awesome and they come and they hug them and, and they just love on them and all that. And that's good. That's awesome. But you know what? It's even better when you come up to someone and you tell them, you know what? I've been through what your struggle is. And let me tell you, this is what God did in my life. Let me tell you, testimony, 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 testimony. I got power because of testimony. I got power because of testimony. I don't know how long this word is going to be just repeating over and over in our sermons, but it's going to repeat because testimony is the key. You want to know the key to your happiness? Testimony. You want to know the key to growth? Testimony. You want to know the key to your financial breakthroughs? Testimony. What? Yes, testimony. Because if I can hear that, you can make it. Let me tell you something. There's some people out there that I look at in my industry, and sometimes I look at them and I say, Lord Almighty, there's a couple of nuts and bolts missing. But they're making millions. And I'm like, you know what? They may have that nut and that bolt missing, but they must have some really good nuts and bolts on. Testimony. And what does that do? That says, if they can make it, oh boy, I can make it. Now I need some more of those. Because the truth is that in certain areas of my life, personally speaking, though I may have achieved this level, I can't see myself here. That's me being honest. Why? This is me. That might be you. And if this is you, I need you. Why? Because it's through your experience of minimizing the big fear that I'm going to be able to get to the point where I am where you are. And it's through my ability to get past, let's say, a big lust and to convert it to a small lust that maybe I'm going to help you to get past your big lust and you're going to help me get past my big fear. Make sense? How do we convert these things, first and foremost? By realizing we have the power. You see, it's not that Captain Pat, going back to weightlifting, it's not that Captain Pat can do the exercise for me. He can't, but he can show me how to do it. It's not that Captain Pat can show me, how, you know, bring me food in every day and say, here, eat this, eat this. No, no, but he can show me what to eat and how much of it to eat. The power that I need to convert myself from a big fear to a small fear or no fear whatsoever, it's already inside of me. All your testimony does is it establishes a roadmap 
so that I can see where I have to go, what I have to do, and how long I have to be able to do it. Does that make sense? You want a road map to knowing how to do ministry? I'm going to give it to you right now. Patience. Okay? Patience in my life is this big. But not because I have a lot of it, but because I have a little bit of it. But God has a road map set out for my life. And what he did was he said, Joel, the only way that I'm going to be able to show you the power of patience in your life is by allowing you to deal with everyone besides yourself and yourself and to get to the point where you realize that everyone is not who you are and everyone is at different levels. One of the biggest issues for me as a pastor is understanding the difference between me and all of you. It's hard. It's hard. Any relationship is the same thing. The problem in relationships is not one person and the other person. It's not his fault or her fault. It's both of your faults. Because you're not investing the time to understand each other. The same thing applies with God. The reason that we have problems in our relationship with God, the reason that a lot of people right now are watching me online instead of in the church is because there's this big gap in the relationship between them and God. And I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about some of you. Is there's this big gap in relationship between them and God, and that pushes them to the point where they say, I can't be there. Why? Because the hint of Christians gives them a sense of God, though they're imperfect. And what happens is that they don't look at the perfect part of the good things in you, but they look at the lacks in you, and they're amplified by the devil in their senses to tell them, you don't need to be in a church. You need to run. Or the devil amplifies their own issues in their life, and he takes that and he puts it right in front of them to the point where they say, how dare I go inside of a holy place? Because now, you see, the devil's a liar, and look how he works. He will let you see either all the bad in people or all the good. What do you mean? He will amplify the good in people so that you can look at your own flaws, and now your low self-esteem is so big, and your, your fear and, and all your other issues, your bitterness. And, and, I mean, the big one to me is the low self-esteem. So now our low self-esteem gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and to the point where that's all we see. So we say, I'm not worthy to be in that place. Look at me. I went out clubbing last night. Look at me. I didn't really go out clubbing. I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> but if I did. And, you know, you, you say, look at me. I, I did this. And, and look at me. I did that. And, and I had too many margaritas. Or I had too many sangrias. Or I had too many coronas. Or I had too many. And, and now look at me. And I can't go to church. And, I, and, and that is the biggest lie of the devil. What are you saying, Pastor? Are you saying you want drunk people in church? I'm saying I want people in church. I don't care if you're drunk. I don't care if you're high. I don't care if you're an adulterer. I don't care if you're a prostitute. I don't care if you're a stripper. I don't care if you're a homosexual. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're green. I don't care if you're yellow. I don't care what you are because at the end of the day, what you are, I probably have a little bit of it inside of me already. And whatever you are, guess what? God is here with the strict purpose of cleansing you and cleansing me. So why would I run from the place that God has delivered me to be in? But I got to realize that I got I got to realize that I have the power to surpass whatever it is that I am. You see, the church is not about telling you what's wrong with you and saying, you're this and you're that. The church is about empowering you to the point where you say, I was this and I was that. But watch this, even when you still are this or that. What do you mean? What I mean is, even if you're still lying, you're not a liar anymore. That's a lie, Pastor. No. Stand in the face of whatever it is that you're dealing with and tell that it, you're not in me anymore. I defeated you, fear. 
I defeated you, low self-esteem. I defeated you, lust. I defeated you. I defeated you. I defeated you. And, and, and what's going to happen is now it's going to amplify in you. And it's going to say, really? You defeated me? Really? Okay. So now tonight when you go to sleep, you're going to hear two noises instead of one. Or today, when you go out, if you're dealing with lust, all of a sudden now you're going to be confronted with two women that are throwing themselves at you instead of one. And now what are you going to do? I got the power. Church is about empowering you so that you realize you have the capability. Now, does that mean that you should look for it? That you should look for the problem to show yourself that you have the power? No. See, a lot of people get wild and, and crazy, and they say, all right, pastor, you're right. I got the power. I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I'm going to the bar just to prove the point that I won't drink. Can I have a water, please, with lime? Can I have a water with a hint of this? Can I have, next thing you know, you're hiccuping and throwing up somewhere. That's not power. That's stupid. Sorry. Power is the ability to say no to that. Power is the ability to say, I can walk by a bar, but I don't need to go inside of it. I know what's inside of it. Power is not looking at something and saying, yeah, I'm in your face, and I'm big and bad, and I'm not going to have you. Let me tell you something. The best fight is the fight that you don't need to fight. Hello. It's being able to look at something and say, I could throw down with you, but I won't. But that's the hardest fight. And I'm going to tell you why. Because that fight causes in us to doubt. Because we don't realize that we fully have the power. You know, when, when, when someone insults you, with social media the way it is today, it's horrific. Greatest thing in the world, worst thing in the world. Greatest because you can meet with people that you can intertwine and do good things for the kingdom of God. Worst because you're going to meet with people that have done stuff in the past to you that are bad that are going to try to suck you back into that world. So what happens is that a lot of times in the social media, you know, the fights are stirred up between couples, between exes, between this and that and family and all this junk. And I hear about it all the time and it's sickening to be quite honest with you. But let's assume, you know, there's this big fight and, and then now you get into a, a, a Facebook fight. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you're going back and forth, and now they go from being friends to acquaintances and end up being blocked altogether. And, and you have the right, you have the power to, to combat someone when they talk bad about you. you. You have the right. But is it right? Is having the right always right? Is it right for you and I to combat someone with words when they're fighting us with words? You see, power is not me being able to speak louder than you or scream louder than you to be able to get you to submit to what I believe in. Power is sometimes to be able to stay away and say, you know what, believe what you want to believe. The truth of the matter is that anyone that loves you will give you the time of day to realize what you are really all about. Someone who doesn't is going to just try to make a lot of noise, to try to be heard, to try to say, I won. You can win as many fights as you want to win. Power is not fought. Power is something that you can stop from doing. Power is something that you can continue doing. Power is something that you know what to do in that moment. Power, true power, sometimes is walking away. True power sometimes is shutting up. True power sometimes is standing up. True power is only something that God can give. How many say amen? Do you have true power? What is power? Watch this. Power, we're going to see in Luke 10, 19, and, and this is pretty much what I'm going to be finishing with today. Yes. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. You can see it up there straight out of the Amplified. The Word of God says, Behold, I have given you authority and power. What does it mean, authority? Authority means that you're the cop. You are the cop for this, what he's going to give you. Watch this. It says, I have made you the cop. I'm changing words now. I have made you the cop, and I have given you power to trample upon serpents and scorpions. Okay, so he, he made you the scorpion and serpent police. Now, let me ask you a question. And I always crack up with this with my wife. I say, oh, when I grew up, I wish I was a cop. Because I'd be giving tickets to all the people who cut short, who make turns where they shouldn't, who do, ro oh, man, I'd be having fun. The people who get road rage, I pull them over and make them wait for like 20 minutes. And then come out and be like, you can go. Just to see their reaction. You know, they're paler. Why? Because I wanted that power, right? So now, if I had that power, would something stop me 
from doing what I wanted to do? No, not at all. You see, with power comes the ability to be able to take that jurisdiction, that area that you're over, and say, this is what I want, that's what I want, this is what I'm going to do, that's what I'm going to do, and that's it. And what do you have to say about it? I have a badge. Here's my badge. Right? I have the power. So now God is saying, behold, I have given you the badge to trample upon serpents and scorpions, and the physical, and look, I love the Amplified version, it says, and the physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses. Now, what is your enemy? Pick it. Is it lust? Is it fear? Is it low self-esteem? Is it hurt? Is it anger? Is it rape? Is it cancer? Is it sickness? Is it bitterness? Or is it jealousy? Or is it one of the other many, many, many multitude of things that it could be? If I am the cop over jealousy, what do I have to do? Ooh, ooh. Jealousy, pull over. What do you mean? What I mean is this. You see, when a cop pulls you over, what he's doing is he's stopping your flow of life. He's telling you, stop whatever you were doing, wherever you were going. I don't care if you're late. I don't care if you got to go to doctors. I don't care if your leg is bleeding. I don't care if your arm's bleeding. I don't care if you're pregnant and you're about to give birth. If I told you to stop and I'm the authority, you stop, period. Amen? So now the cop came up, he rolled up behind you, and your day completely stopped. And guess what? You're not thinking of anything except the ticket that's coming your way, right or wrong. I don't care if the cop is whatever it is. I just, Lord, how do I get out of this one? So here is God telling you, you are the cop. You are the police officer over jealousy in your life. I want you to pull jealousy over. And you say, Pastor, how do I pull jealousy over? You pull jealousy over by stopping jealousy in its tracks and saying, jealousy, stop right there. I have something to tell you, jealousy. See, now you're dealing with jealousy head on. You don't have any distractions. You're not riding on the highway saying, excuse me, I'm going to give you a ticket. Slow down. Do 53. Hold on. No, no, no. Get closer. All right. Move over here. Stop. Jealousy, I have something to tell you. And input whatever your issue is. Hurt, I have something to tell you. Anger, I have something to tell you. Bitterness, I have something to tell you. And when you stop that situation, you're going to look at it in the face knowing that you have been given that badge. You are a police officer over whatever it is that you're dealing with. You have been given the right, the mental and spiritual ability, strength to be able to say, wait a second. Why did you do what you just did? You're going to jail. Now I'm detaining you. See, some of us need to detain the issues that we've been dealing with in life. Some of us need to take those issues and put them in cuffs and say, you know what? You were here for way too long in my life. You have taken up way too much time in my life. You have, I mean, do you understand why cops pull over people who are speeding? Because they're a danger. Because if you go fast enough, if a little rock hits your tire, you can spin out. And you're not only going to kill yourself, you're going to kill everybody around you. That's the reason that cops pull people over. Well, most cops. So what is God trying to do? He's trying to say, look, this hurt that's driving down in the highway of your life is going at a velocity, at a speed, in a disarray that's so bad that that hurt is going to convert into lust because it's going to drive you away from the arms of your spouse and all of a sudden into arms of someone else, which is going to convert into a sickness because now all of a sudden that person had AIDS. And I mean, have you seen those commercials for the insurance and the guy is, you know, like eating food and, and, and all of a sudden they say because he ate food, then he did this. And next thing you know, he's like getting run over by a car and he's saying all he could have done was call this company and he wouldn't have had anything. Well, that's the same way it happens in our life. Because we allow hurt to run in our life so much, all of a sudden now hurt drives us into our arms of people that we think are going to protect us, but they're not really protecting us. They may be beating on us, and all of a sudden that's going to lead us to a relationship and abuse, and it all started with hurt. And now we come full circle, and we end up in a relationship where now that person had this and this, and now we're sick, and now our life has completely changed because one day somebody hurt us. Does this make sense? We have to pull over those situations in our life. 
God is telling you in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Behold, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses. What kind of power? Say it. It says all the power, and watch this, and it says, and nothing, nothing, nothing shall in any way harm you. What do you mean? What I mean is that God has given you a badge to stop the hurt in your life. Do you have the power? Say it. I got the power. I got the power. You guys are being too religious for me today. I, I, I need you to really get this down. See, power is not something that's executed very mildly and quietly. Power is something that has strength behind it. There's a stimulant behind power. Power is power. 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 When you're in the gym, you know why people grunt and make so much noise? Because they're telling their body, shut up. You know why? If you're loud enough, your muscles don't realize that you're hurting enough. You're like, ah! That's power. We are in the spiritual gymnasium. Okay? We're in a training ground. We have been brought to this earth for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that's to train in the house of God, to train and prepare for what? For the day that we're able to stand before his presence, lift up our arms and worship in him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and know that I don't need anything, I don't care about anything. Why? Because if I do happen to need something, I have the healer and I have the provider and I have the great I am that will give me everything I want. Why do you think we deal with the things we deal with? Because he wants to to prove the fact on earth that he is our everything of everything. You have the power. While we're on earth, we got to start exerting our power. We got to start telling things around us. I have the power. I won't live in defeat anymore. I won't live in anger anymore. I won't live in hurt anymore. I have the power. I have the ability. I have the ability to change my life. I have the ability to change my relationship. I have the ability to change my finances. Pastor, how do I do it? Just do it! I think Mr. Wilde is getting it. Do you have the power to realize that you have been called by God, that you have been given the authority to trample on anything? Now I ask you, are you dealing with anything? If you're dealing with something, I want you to stand to your feet right now. Anything. Wow, if you're not dealing with anything, I want your power. I want you to read Luke 10, 19 with me. See it up there? I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to say it. You repeat it with me. Okay? You're in the academy now. Now you're saying your oath. This is your oath. Ready? Behold. I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all power that the enemy possesses and nothing I'll say it again and nothing and nothing and nothing, and nothing in any way will harm you. I have the power. I have the power. I have the power. I have the power. Now I want you to just close your eyes for a moment with me. Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. Like, comment, and subscribe at www.facebook.com slash NBMI New York or www.youtube.com slash MBMI Church. Also, check out our new and improved website at www.newbeginningschurches.com or iglesianuevoprincipio.com. Want to receive our daily devotional? Email us at info at newbeginningschurches.com 
to sign up. Thank you. Until next time, God bless.